Well, as you've heard already, officially we're starting the Advent season today, which means it's the Christmas season, and it doesn't seem like we're done with Thanksgiving quite yet, does it? <laughs> Only four weeks until Christmas, and for all you underachievers out there who haven't done all of your Christmas shopping yet, I got a question for you. What on earth are you waiting for? <laughs> Black Friday is history. All the good deals are done. Aren't you worried? Aren't you worried? A actually, actually, I thought I, I thought I saw a little glimmer of hope this time around about how retailers were handling the whole Black Friday thing this year. You, you remember a few years ago, there seemed to be this drive where all the stores were trying to outdo each other to see who could be open sooner on Thanksgiving Day, on Thursday, not just Black Friday, but also on Thursday. And I think this year we were beginning to see a little bit of a backlash. People finally said, well, maybe we've had enough already. This was a lead story in the business section of the New York Times this last week, November 15th. More retailers are choosing to close on Thanksgiving Day. I think that's kind of refreshing. Maybe, maybe even cause for some optimism, although there's still this, this cynical little voice telling me, don't hold your breath, because the only reason they decided to stay closed on Thanksgiving was because uh, staying open didn't do much for the bottom line. Sometimes we just have to tell that little voice to shut up. <laughs> because I would, I would much rather think that retailers decided that letting their employees spend time with their families was more important than profit. Wouldn't that be great? We get to choose whether to be cynical or optimistic. And this is nothing new in our culture. This, this idea of being cynical about the motives of retailers is nothing new. People have been suspicious of the motives of retail stores for a long time now. Nothing new there. 70 years ago, hard to believe it was that long ago, 70 years ago there was a holiday movie that came out called Miracle on 34th Street. Anyone remember this wonderful film? Not the two remakes, by the way, but, but the original black and white version starring Edmund Gwynn, Natalie Wood when she was a little girl, and the late, great Maureen O'Hara. I still watch it every year, and, and I'm amazed at how well it continues to hold up today. 1947 may as well have been a century ago for all the changes that we've seen since then, and yet I think the movie was way ahead of its time. Think about the character that Maureen O'Hara played in that film. She starred in the role of Doris Walker. She was a single mother who, even back then, was in the process of breaking the glass ceiling. She was depicted as a strong, highly competent woman and a free thinker. She didn't want her daughter exposed to things like fairy tales or superstition or supernatural explanations for natural phenomena. And she didn't need a man to save her. She wasn't afraid to tell her potential boyfriend lawyer what her boundaries were in very clear and uncertain terms. This was an unusual role for a woman in 1947, don't you think? If you haven't seen the movie yet, Doris works for Macy's, the big department store in New York. She's the director of the big Thanksgiving Day Parade, which is a full-time, year-round job with some major responsibilities. Ed Gwynn plays Chris Kringle, who becomes Macy's department store Santa, and of course he thinks he really is Santa. So before he starts working as Santa, the toy department manager decides to give Santa a coaching session, of all things. The toy department manager is going to give Santa a coaching session where he tells him how to sell toys that Macy's carried and especially how to move and push the toys that, was, that, were, that were overstocked. So we've got a brief clip of this scene here this morning, so let's watch Before you go on the phone, I just want to give you a few tips on how to be a good Santa Claus. Right ahead. Uh, here's a list of toys that we have to push. You know, 
<laughs> things that we're overstocked on. Now you'll find that a great many children will be undecided as to what they want for Christmas. When that happens, you immediately suggest one of these items. You understand? I certainly do. <laughs> <laughs> now you memorize that list. No. Oh, no, no, no. I'll tell you, when you finish, come up to the seventh floor. I'll be waiting for you. Imagine. Making a child take something he doesn't want just because he bought too many of the wrong toys. That's what they've been fighting against for years, the way they commercialize Christmas. Yeah, there's a lot of bad isms floating around this world, but one of the worst is commercialism. Make a buck, make a buck. Even in Brooklyn it's the same. Don't care what Christmas stands for, just make a buck, make a buck. Oh, don't fire off the way again. Huh? Oh, thank you, Beverly. And what should I do with these? Throw them on a the floor. I get kind of tired just sweeping up dust. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> So there you have it. As Alfred said, there's a lot of bad isms going on out there in the world, and the waste of them is commercialism. <laughs> so Santa has his marching orders, which are sell, 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 even if it's not what the customer wants. And as you can see, he's not very happy about that, is he? Right? So one day, a child comes to visit Santa Claus, and he wants something for Christmas that Macy's doesn't carry. So Chris tells the boy's mom about another store in the city where he could find, where she could find exactly what he wanted. Mr. Shellheimer there, the toy department manager, he's listening and he <laughs> overhears the conversation and he practically has a heart attack. Until the mother comes up to him later and she says, I'm not sure what's going on here, but it was wonderful to see a big outfit like Macy's putting Christmas spirit above making a buck. And she goes on to say she was never a big Macy's shopper, but from now on, Macy's would get all of her business. And of course, the proverbial light goes on. And the next thing you know, it's official store policy, complete with a press release telling New York shoppers that if Macy's doesn't carry it, They'll direct you to exactly where you can find it, and the new policy is a sensation. So much so that the rival department store across town, Gimbel's, decides that they're going to have to try to one-up Macy's by doing the same thing and making a few changes. And the next thing you know, these two big stores are competing for the title of the most altruistic capitalist enterprise in New York City. <laughs> trying to outdo each other in acts of kindness and customer service. And of course, Doris and Chris get a big bonus from Mr. Macy and everyone lived happily ever after. Now, there's a lot more to the story than that, but I'm not going to ruin that for you. You need to see this movie again. But, but wouldn't it be great if there was more cooperation instead of cutthroat competition? Cutthroat competition, win at all costs. Those are examples of what we call a zero-sum game. In the zero-sum game, in order for me to win, you have to lose. It's a win-lose proposition. The opposite of the zero-sum game is the win-win scenario, which is what we're seeing in Miracle on 34th Street. There's really no downside to what Macy's and Gimbel's are doing. There's competition, but there are no losers in this game. You know, it, it, it's too bad that we don't pay attention to themes like this, um, or that we only seem to pay attention to themes and ideas like this when Christmas rolls around. The rest of the year provides us with way too much time for cynicism and zero-sum thinking. And that's how it gets entrenched in consciousness. Consider the themes of some of our other popular Christmas movies and TV shows. These are the ones that come back every year at this time, the ones that we look forward to seeing. Shows like uh, 
What do we got up here? Oh, a Charlie Brown Christmas. Every year we watch Charlie Brown, the unpopular, socially awkward boy who is mocked for being different. All he wants to do is be accepted for who he is. All he wants to do is to find the real meaning of Christmas instead of all the greed, all the commercialism that he's constantly surrounded with. There's that word, commercialism again. Or how about this next one here? The Charles Dickens classic, A Christmas Carol, the story of Ebenezer Scrooge, the greedy moneylender who has no room in his life for human kindness, compassion, generosity, festivity. He measures everything in terms of whether it's profitable or not. He's miserable, he's lonely, and everyone knows it except him. In one of the scenes, he dies in the dream world of Christmas yet to come, and the only people who seem to care that he's died are the ones who are looting his belongings and selling them to the rag and bone man. The happy ending is when Scrooge is transformed from his former miserable self to the generous and altruistic Scrooge that we all see on Christmas Day, that story of transformation. And finally, the masterpiece. It's a Wonderful Life. The story of George Bailey, the idealist, versus the cynical, greedy banker and real estate mogul, Mr. Potter. George wants to help people get ahead. Potter wants to exploit them. He calls them garlic eaters, who need to be kept in their place at the bottom of the social order no matter what. When the 1929 stock market crash happened, George gave his own money to people to help them to buy food to tide them over until the banks reopened. Potter preyed on their fears to get them to sell out cheap so that he could take over more businesses and all of the chaos and the fear of the economic downturn. Think for a moment about who the heroes are in these stories and the values that were advanced by them. The rich, the powerful, are not the role models. Money and possessions are not the focus. Greed, egotism, cynicism, selfishness are rejected in exchange for generosity, selflessness, and altruism. Competition is rejected in exchange for cooperation. The win-win scenario is what prevails. These stories come back every single year. We're 16 years into the new millennium and it seems that some things never change. We keep hearing these stories over and over again because I think the problem is that we haven't learned the lessons yet. Every year when the days are the shortest and the darkness is at its height, we wake up and we get back in touch with values and ideas that we totally ignore the rest of the year. We watch, we listen, and we say, yeah, isn't that wonderful? Don't you feel all warm and fuzzy inside watching these things? That's the way it ought to be. Peace on earth, all that good stuff. We do it for a month, and then we go right back to sleep until next Christmas rolls around. Part of the problem is that we keep waiting for something or someone out there somewhere to come along and to rescue us, to make things better for us. It's the first Sunday of Advent, as I mentioned earlier, which is traditionally a time of waiting. Advent means arrival, as in waiting for something to get here. It's the time of waiting and anticipation leading up to Christmas Day when someone was born who was supposed to save us. That's the Christmas story, isn't it? That's the traditional Christmas story. And that was, oh, I don't know, around 2016 years ago, give or take a few years, depending on who you listen to. 2016 years ago, and we've been waiting ever since. 
Maybe it's time for a little different perspective for a new millennium for this Christmas. You know, the one thing that all mythical heroes, saviors, and avatars have in common is that they're really archetypes. They're archetypes that represent qualities that have always existed, guess where? Right here in each of us, yeah. Whether it's the Christ in the original Christmas story, or anything else that we might admire in the heroes and the role models in our favorite Christmas movies and TV shows, the reason that we admire these archetypes is because they're showing us qualities that we all possess. That's why we admire them. I think it's a mistake to think that Advent is just a season that leads up to a, to a one-time-in-history in event called Christmas, where a special Savior comes from out there somewhere to fix everything for us. Think of some of the songs that we sing at Christmas, especially the, the song, Silent Night. We think about the words to that song, and it sounds like we're talking about something that only happened back then, way in the distant past, that silent night, that holy night, that one-time event. When the fact is, any night can be a silent and holy night. Because holiness is really in the eye of the beholder, right? Holiness is an attitude. It's an attitude of respect and gratitude for life and the universe and everything in it. Why would we want to reserve that just for one time a year? And then there's the imagery of mother and child, which is also timeless. All children are born with something to offer, a role to play that's not predetermined, but it's for them to discern, along with us, along with our support, to discern that, to celebrate it, to allow it to unfold. What, what particular archetype does this child or that child bring into the world? Not just a one-time thing. Being born human doesn't mean we're insignificant creatures in need of salvation. We don't have to be prone to not learning these lessons time and time again. We can get it because it's, it's, it's in our humanity that we find things like compassion, altruism, reason, creativity, and I could go on and on, but you get the list. It's a long one. Those are the things that can and will be our salvation without the need for supernatural intervention. It's already here. So I think the message of Christmas for this new millennium is keep watching, keep reading the stories, and then internalize them and realize that what they're talking about is already here. So maybe, just maybe, one of these years we won't go back to sleep for the rest of the year. See you next week.